Hi, I'm Gene Smith. I live on Plum Island. I grew up in Medford. Uh, graduated from Medford High School in 1941. Uh, I was 15 years old. That's because my birthday was in mid late May, and I couldn't uh, go to kindergarten at the normal 15-year-old age, so they wouldn't let me in. And uh, I stayed home that year, and I was raised by uh, two great aunts uh, because my mother and father both worked. We were in the depths of the Depression, and uh, they decided that I should learn to write, uh, read, and they taught me how to read. And uh, I got out, of, uh, I missed uh, kindergarten because of that age thing. So you were five at that point? Huh? You were five? Five, yeah. Uh, and uh, so I started a year later. Yeah. And uh, they had taught me how to read. And. Uh, <coughs> I went to school to kindergarten a year later, and uh, I went to school with the newspaper rolled up under my arm, and while the other kids were reading Henny Penny and stuff like that, I brought the newspaper. Hmm. And uh, the teacher saw that and moved me up to the second grade immediately. and. Uh, then then they moved me to the third grade, so I started out, caught up with the <coughs> people who were two years older than me. Huh. And uh, consequently, I got out of high school when I was 15, and we're in the height depths of the Depression. Well, can you tell me a little bit about the dep what, what was it? What was it like living during the Depression? Well, uh... We lived hand to mouth. I mean, my father had two or three jobs for a while, and he'd get canned and get another job. That's the way it was, because uh, nothing was solid. And uh, so I get out of school, and I, we were relatively poor. And I wanted to go to college. I had only one college in mind. Uh, I did not apply elsewhere. It was Dartmouth. Because also in those days, <coughs> Dartmouth was the premier hockey school in America. But I got out and uh, we couldn't afford it. So I went to work in uh, factories, various factories. I worked for Converse Rubber and New England Bedding. And then I finished that, and I get to thinking that, gee, I've been out of school for a year. How will I ever get back into it? So uh, Hebron Academy had been after me to go and play hockey. So I went and uh, played hockey for a year. I was captain of Hebron which was then the top hockey prep school in the East. <coughs> and uh, I got out, and the next day I was drafted. And I went into the Army. They shipped us down to Camp Croft in uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina. So what in your, after you graduate, after you got out of Hebron, you know, what was going through your mind when you the thought of being drafted, you know, like, what, what, what were you thinking? Well, I knew that was the only way you would go. And uh, I worried about what I would do about uh, college. But uh, <coughs> Dartmouth was set, had set on me. I, I point out, I always graduated with honors from every school I went to. And uh, so I got out of Hebron, and as I said, the next day I wound up in infantry training 
at Camp Croft in South Carolina, Spartanburg. And when I got through that 13 weeks of training, uh, the Army had a program, ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. They took young uh, college students and high school students with higher IQs and they tossed it in, into college. I had not gone to college at all. So they sent me to the University of Connecticut and uh, I went there for 13 weeks and came back after a, a week off and started again. But the Army had need for uh, soldiers in the infantry. The war was getting pretty bad in Europe. So they uh, put us back into the infantry. I didn't mind uh, that because I was a, a jock and a, a student. But I mean, they, they put in kids with high IQs who should never in God's world been in the infantry. But they pushed them in. And we got out and we were assigned to the 78th Division in Camp Pickett, Virginia. Uh, <coughs> We were there for a while, and then in October, they shipped us to Europe. And uh, we got up into combat in Germany in uh, the early, first weeks in uh, December. Uh, the infantry had captured Aachen, which was on the German-Belgian border, and we joined the uh, combat there, and we moved uh, east into the Hürtgen Forest, which is a little-known battle area, but it, it had the most, the heaviest casualties the infantry has ever had. The battle started in October. We finally uh, won the area. And when we captured the town of Schmidt at the very end of January. But we went in at Malmedy, M A L M E D Y, in Germany, which was the first inside German city outside of Aachen that was captured. And we captured it in the first week in December. And we established a bridgehead there and moved about three miles north. And we established a, a combat area, <coughs> dug in and so on. And two days later, the infantry brought in the 106th Division, which had never been in combat. And they put them in this area because they figured it was uh, a real safe area, nothing would be happening. We pulled out and uh, moved about three miles north. And that, that night, the Germans broke through at Malmedy, and that was the start of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, so much for military intelligence. Huh. We dug in north of uh, Malmedy in Simarath, and we stayed there through Jan December and January and did uh, nightly uh, uh, trips, uh, trips into Germany laid mines. I was in a mine platoon of the 311th Infantry. And we laid mines and pulled out German mines and booby traps. An interesting aside was the night before Christmas Eve, we were on patrol into Germany, into beyond Simrath. It was a perfectly clear night with a full moon. And my best buddy was leading the squad, and I was <coughs> at the end. 
carrying a machine gun to cover them. And all at once we stopped, he put up the signal, and he made the motion to come back. And he came back and uh, came up to me and I said, what was that all about? I said, I ran into a German patrol. I said, how close were you? He said, I could have shook hands with them. But he said, the German looked at me and I looked at him and he motioned, go back, and I motioned, come back. Huh. So, <laughs> not a shot was fired. The next night, Christmas Eve, we were on this rise and uh, there was a big bonfire down in the valley and all at once we heard the Germans sing Heile Genach, Stille Genach, Silent Night, Holy Night. And uh, we could have called in a barrage or anything, but no one did anything. We just waved to them and they waved back to us. And uh, over the next three weeks we fought our way out and got to Schmidt. And that was the end of the Battle of the Bulge and the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest. So, did what was it like being in that? You know, how old were you at that point when you got were, get shipped into Europe? I was nineteen. Yeah. And uh, what was going through your mind when you were doing that? Well, we knew that we're in an infantry outfit, and uh, we knew what that could lead to. Uh, I must say that I resented the Army Specialized Training Program because they took people with higher intellect and uh, I didn't really mind it. I looked upon combat as uh, more or less like a game. I had been a competitor all my life. but. A lot of the guys that were in it should never in God's world have been in the infantry. Yeah. For example, one day we were in this town of Simrath and the brass decided they wanted to knock out this pillbox which was on the outskirts of the town. And so they put in a barrage of artillery and then they sent this Chinese kid, Chinese-American kid, out with a place charge, uh, place charges, TNT on the end of a pole, and you put it where you want, like in front of the opening in a pillbox, mm -hmm. and then you pull the trigger and it blows up and knocks everything out inside. And this Chinese guy, he had an IQ out of sight. And he should never in God's world have been in the infantry. But he went up there and he pulled the trigger and it didn't work. So they yelled at him to do it again and do it again. And finally they said, come back. And he dropped the pole charge and got back about three feet and the Germans depressed their machine guns and killed them outright. I mean, to this day I resent that because that guy should never have been in the infantry. He could have been a world leader. But there were an awful lot of guys who got wiped out by the ASTP program who shouldn't have been in the infantry. Uh, I found life in the infantry. We were, like I say, a mine platoon. And our job was to uh, place mines around perimeters and to remove German mines and booby traps. We used to joke, it's a, it's an inter it's a great job if you until you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we escaped that. And we got through the Hurtgen Forest and Schmidt and then advanced on to, uh, into Germany. And one day we got called up and mo mobilized everything that could move. The infantry had unexpectedly captured 
the bridge at Remagen, which went across the uh, Rhine River. And we got across, we went across the second day. The third day they uh, blew it up and we were on the other side of the, of the Rhine River. <laughs> An interesting aside, we captured this uh, castle above the river. Drachenfels was the castle. It's the highest point that the infantry had ever captured hmm. above the Rhine River. And there was this beautiful house there. And uh, we went in, and this German who owned it was there. And uh, he spoke perfect English. So we went in, and I had developed a taste for champagne, pink champagne in particular. So I got talking to him, and I said, do you have champagne? And he said, of course. I said, do you have pink champagne? He said, yes. I said, well, get a bottle. And he went down into his wine cell and brought back, back a bottle. And uh, we opened it, and I started to grab the bottle, and he grabbed my hand, and he said, wait. He said, one does not drink champagne like that out of a bottle. And I said, have you got champagne glasses? He said, of course. So I got them, and he and I had champagne, and I said to him, uh, uh, you know, you could have gotten shot then. And he said, yes, but he said, what good would have done you? And I said, uh, how come you speak such good English? Well, developed, he was the general manager of the Ford plant in Cologne, Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. So we got through there. When we left, we picked up, made a sign and put it in his door. This house was captured by the 311th Infantry, and I forget the German's name. He is a friend of ours, do not do anything to him. So we went through and continued on and got into Remagen, and we got across the bridge on the second day, and uh, uh, then we moved on in. And uh, when the war ended, we were shipped up to the Ruhr Valley. And I uh, was in a regular platoon. <laughs> and uh, we just did practically nothing. Just waited around and killed time and did normal army exercises. And out of the blue, I got put into special services because I was a baseball catcher and they were going to have a baseball team in the spring. <coughs> and this regimental colonel had never seen hockey. And he decided he wanted to see hockey. And they went through their files and they appointed me the head of the hockey program. Well, in the meantime, we moved into Berlin, and I headed, at 19 years old, I headed the hockey program for the uh, German, for the American Army in Berlin, and we put out a call for hockey players, and we wound up with an awful lot of uh, Boston high school, Boston area high school players and a bunch of college players. And we went down to garmisch partenkirchen which had been the site of the 1938 Olympics. And we played a World Army Championship there. And uh, we wound up second place. And they picked an all-American team. And I was fortunate enough to be chosen for that. And uh, we then toured Europe and played Canadian teams in London and in Paris. And then we played European teams from Switzerland and Sweden. 
And uh, when we finished that season, and I stayed on until the spring, and was catcher for the Berlin Army team. And then I decided, well, I'm even with the Army, and I took my discharge and came back home. And uh, I checked in Dartmouth, and they still had my place open. And I went into Dartmouth. They credited me with my year at University of Connecticut, so I went in as a sophomore. So what, what did it mean to you to, to serve in the uh, World War II and stuff? Because I think it just uh, somebody in growing up, you know, in this in the latest yeah. generation, like reading about everything that happened in World War II, I mean, what does it mean to you or how does it make you feel to, you know, be known as one of the greatest generations? And well, I thought... Uh, I thought that we had accomplished a lot in the war, and uh, I thought that we had a lot to teach the younger generation. Uh, we showed them how bad it was to be set back and have everything delayed and then play catch up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that, that's the basic. Uh, I was proud of what we had done, and uh, I thought we had a lot to teach these kids, with these younger people, which I did. And I went through three years at Dartmouth, majored in uh, American literature. Let's talk a little bit about, you grew up, you loved hockey, right? Yeah. And you, and you played hockey there. Tell me a little bit about playing hockey at Dartmouth and and how you played, was it the first NCAA championship or Yeah, something? yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the 1947 team, which played in the first, what turned out to be the first uh, NCAA hockey championship. Uh, we played against Michigan, uh, BC, and uh, uh, and uh, Colorado College, Michigan won, but it was the first uh, NCAA playoff. Uh, we were the only, well, no, BC and U.S. would only, and uh, Dartmouth were the only teams that would only allow uh, Americans to play. The other teams were laced with Canadians. Yeah. And Michigan won. Uh, so uh, that was the end of my hockey career. And uh, uh, applied for journalism school at Columbia. And uh, never thought I'd get in, but I did. So and. I graduated number two in my class, and in the midst of the spring of that year, this one professor who had been like a mentor to me. At, at Columbia or Dartmouth? At uh, Columbia. Yep. Uh, said to me, when you come to school tomorrow, uh, I want you to wear a suit and a tie and be at your very best. And I said, why? He said, well, I'll show you. Well, I came to class. He said, come on, let's go. And we went out of the uh, school and got on the subway. And we went down to uh, Wall Street, got off the Wall Street stop. And he took me over to the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I said, what the heck are we doing here? He said, I want you to meet some people. So he introduced me to the editor and the publisher and a bunch of their top writers. And I chatted with them. And we left and we got back on the subway and he said to me, you got it. And I said, I got what? He said, they're going to offer you a, a job. I said, who's going to offer me a job? He said, the Wall Street Journal. 
And I said, I've never taken an economics course or anything. He said, don't worry about it. Next day, I get a call from the Wall Street Journal, and sure enough, they offered me a job. So, so, so I went to work in the Wall Street Journal, and I worked there for 18 months. I was covering television, not from the critical side, but from the business side. Was it just, was it kind of a new thing at that point? Huh? Was television a new thing? Oh, yeah, it was the start of the television. And uh, uh, I got through 18 months there, and out of the blue, I got a call from the New York Herald Tribune, which is the greatest paper there ever was in, in uh, New York and in the United States. And they gave me a job, and uh, I was covering the business side of television, and out of the blue, I got a call from uh, uh, the Herald Tribune, and uh, they made me a, an offer. And as I said, I wasn't covering the critical side, I was covering the business side. And uh, at the Herald Tribune, out of the blue, I get a call from the New York Times, and that was uh, the, the goal of anyone. Uh, I had never thought in God's world that I would be <coughs> I would be in New York, and I didn't want to be in New York. But I was the only one in my class who never left, hmm. and uh, so I took the job at the Times. And they had me covering, again, television from the business side. And I guess someone figured, well, television is run by electricity. And so they tossed me into a beat covering uh, uh, utilities. Hmm. And that was my specialty at the uh, uh, New York Times, uh, utilities. And uh, I stayed there for 25 years, and uh, I decided I could go no further, so I quit and freelanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, freelanced for a few years, and uh, then retired. And my wife was running, she had f founded the top theatrical PR firm in the nation. And uh, one day she said to me, what are we going to do now? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm going to retire. And I said, well, what did it, would you like to do? We had this house on Plum Island, which we used in the summers. And uh, she said, well, I'd like to move to Plum Island. And I said, wow, that's exactly what I wanted. She was from New York, and I never thought that she would want to do that. So we moved to uh, Plum Island, and I've been here ever since.